In this video, we're taking an incredible peek behind the scenes of LEGO Star Wars during the end of its classic era and beginning of its golden age at a 2005 Star Wars Celebration 3 presentation by LEGO employee Rob Johnson called Designing LEGO Star Wars Toys. It's going to cover product, minifigure, and packaging design, and it's not every day we get to see a peek behind the scenes like this with LEGO Star Wars. They've become so secretive. Something like this, especially from the older era of LEGO Star Wars that many of us look back on so nostalgically, is very cool, and we get a real cool peek at what could have been. So so let's get into it. The first slide that he had was just the Lego Creative Center in Enfield. But skipping along, the first thing they show off is this original concept of what would become the 2003 Geonosian Starfighter, interestingly in a light tan color as opposed to the brown color that we ended up getting. And of course, it's done with very rudimentary, simple bricks because some of the pieces that they would end up using for this build did not exist during the design process and had to be designed especially for this and of course have been used for years and years since. But the first time they were introduced would have been with a set like this Geonosian Starfighter. It's one of those models from the early years that has aged very nicely. I really wish LEGO Star Wars would release prototype imagery like that more often. It's just so incredibly cool to see something like that. And we have more coming later in the video. But the next slide had some very interesting product design process information, basically how you go from idea to finished product. So the first thing they would do is come up with a set ideas list, send it over to Lucasfilm. Lucasfilm would say, hey, that's great. You can make all of these. Following that, they'd start building the prototypes. And interestingly, the marketing lead picks the best model from the assortment. So the designers, I guess, don't pick the best models? I'm not sure. Obviously, we're not getting all the detail here. These are just bullet points, and I imagine it's a little bit more nuanced than just one guy handpicking everything. Maybe the designers are able to go and say, hey, we really think you should reconsider this or that, but the marketing lead picks the best models, apparently. Models are then revised, play value, and functions are added. It's then calculated to ensure the correct piece count and price point, which is an interesting one. I wish I could have heard the presentation to hear what they have to say about that specifically. Finally, they do the construction tests, and then the final pro prototypes are approved by Lucasfilm, and then after the label sheets and decorations are designed, surprising to me that it wouldn't happen before it's approved by Lucasfilm. So maybe that's how a figure like the 212th Trooper slips by the watchful eye of a company like Lucasfilm. Next, we have a very cool page with some of the three to one scale minifigure head sculpts of Chewbacca, Geonosian, one of the rebel pilot helmets, and of course, C-3PO there. Very neat to see just some of those I've never seen before. And then they give the minifigure design process here. And I think this is something that's pretty cool to hear about, but there's a lot of steps to that process seemingly especially when it comes to creating a new mold for a character like a C-3PO, like a Bosque, like an at, -AT driver helmet type of thing. And they get plenty of reference material, it says. It looks like they get special photos from the set, which, you know, I think we all knew, but just some cool stuff that you can kind of see specifically what they would have had for different characters back in the day. But right here is one of the coolest pictures from the entire presentation showing the original Stormtrooper helmet designs. And they are rough. They use the word rough on the top. It is rough. The bottom left two are really, really bad but they are also quite interesting. They're Lego's attempt at designing the Stormtrooper helmet to be very similar to the design language that we saw in many other Trooper helmets of the era, including the Scout Trooper, the Emperor's Royal Guards, and the early Clone Troopers, where you would actually have the open holes to represent the eyes with the black head underneath. Lego ended up going in a printed direction for the Stormtrooper eyes and mouthpiece, but it's very interesting to see that they actually did try this. It's also good to know it was horrible. This 3 to 1 Yoda sculpt is super spooky looking and what is interesting is I know that later on when they talk about Admiral Akbar in future years they only do half of the head because they just mirror it. So I wonder why in the early days, it seems they didn't do half of the Yoda head to create the, the sculpt like that. We actually uh, sculpt the head in, uh, in clay by hand. And after that, it is video scanned and it's then a computer file. It will be mirrored, scaled down. This is scale three to one. But nonetheless, we can see another really cool one here with the Super Battle Droid, and they end up showing that Super Battle Droid with one of the test molds. And what I think is interesting with the test mold here is the plastic actually looks like the normal Lego plastic just because of the shine on it, basically. It's not that kind of metallic plastic that they ended up using for the Super Battle Droids for years and years and years. And so I do wonder if that would have had an effect on how much that Battle Droid basically snaps when people go to attach the legs or attach 
attach the arms. They go on to show off the Greedo head quite in depth with quite a few different steps to the process here. You can see different color Greedo heads, including that, you know, red prototype Greedo head. A lot of people used to collect those. They used to be super expensive before the Mexico factory started going wild. The Rebel helmet sculpt is another really old one, definitely made in the late 90s before the theme even released to the public. We also get a quick peek at the Chewbacca mold, which is interesting because it's actually got like a filled up inside when they did the sculpt. One of the terms I'm not super familiar with is copper electrode, but they show off exactly what that is with the Gamorrean guard here. It's one of those things that I wish I had seen the presentation for a better explanation of how it's actually used during the process because I am wholly unfamiliar with that. Another really cool insight they give is the Jabba the Hut. Now they show off a picture that is a hand painted one-to-one -one resin hard copy, but even cooler are the three pictures here. SLA, not familiar with the term there. And then they show even more of the process, including the red prototype Jabba the Hut in the middle, which really pops. And perhaps with that copper electrode included, the Gamorrean guard shows the most complete process of the minifigure sculpt design from sculpt to finish minifigure. But they do show off a few more kind of prototypey pictures, including that 2002 clone trooper, the biker scout, a quote unquote rapid prototype of the snow trooper, a Sebulba three to one hard copy where you can see the Leia minifigure for the scale there. And lastly, in the minifigure section is this really rough looking Qui-Gon prototype where you have hand applied decorations, which I guess means hand painted on the torso. The head looks like it's been chewed up by a dog. The lightsaber to me is more interesting here as the blade has a lot more bubbles than I feel like I've seen in a lightsaber blade before. And the hilt is actually a very unique prototype hilt that we never ended up seeing in any Lego Star Wars sets ever. Just very cool, clean chrome look. But that was all for the minifigure side of things. Now, next they go into the packaging design process where they go pretty in depth. You can pause to read the whole process if you want, but I'm much more interested in some of the imagery that we're gonna be able to see here. They start out with the principal design here, which is basically the template that all the other boxes that are of the same theme and same wave are gonna share. And then the SKU design for the TIE Fighter here specifically just adds in all of the imagery for the TIE Fighter. Unfortunately, no prototype images there. These next images are what got me. We have prototype images of the Wookiee attack set, and it actually is gonna go through seven different versions of the box art for this Wookiee attack set. But over three years ago, I actually stumbled upon one of these images that was used as a preliminary design in like a retailer catalog back in 2005 for that Wookiee attack set. So I had actually seen this before. Many of you have hopefully seen this before in my older video. And so when I put them all on screen here, you can see layout round two is actually the design that I was familiar with from that original prototype design image back in the day. But I wanna take a peek at image one because I never noticed this with the image two, but the design on the Wookiee flyer is actually significantly different than what we saw in the final version. Obviously the Corporate Alliance tank droid is significantly different, but we already knew that. I mean, you can see the tan color. Aesthetically, it just looks nothing like what the final build ended up looking like due to all the color changes and decorations added to it. But the spider droid is actually significantly different in this original box art because it's not sitting properly, like it's on its feet, but just the little toes on the feet. So I thought that was particularly weird on that round one box art design. But you can see they toyed with a few different layouts and backgrounds for the box art on this set. Not something they have to do on half of their sets modern day because they all just get black box art. But back in the day, you can see quite a bit of work went into something like this. And I do quite like, especially layout number five, because it really does show the conflict between the Wookiees and the droids here. However, I think what they ended up with works really good too, because on some of the earlier rounds, it basically makes it look like the Wookiee flyer is just about to crash into the Corporate Alliance tank droid, and I just didn't think that worked here, and obviously they didn't either, so they went with something else, but very cool to see a lot of that behind the scenes process. It'd be really neat if LEGO Star Wars would go ahead and just release more stuff like this from the early days where you just have all these different prototype designs for early LEGO Star Wars box arts, but this presentation is about to get even crazier after we take a look at what I think is the least interesting thing about this whole presentation, and that's actually the photography. Yeah, they used to take good pictures of Lego Star Wars sets so that they didn't falsely advertise them like they do now. And I wish they would go back to this because then we wouldn't have a lot of the problems that we have today with it. But it's really cool to see how it used to work. And you can see a lot of the intricacies of the process and just how much work went into taking one photo of the UCS Imperial Star Destroyer in a room. The grind was very respectable, but following 2003 and going into 2004, Lego Star Wars was going to change their box art from this to an original trilogy edition. And so that's how we ended up with two different box arts. But some of the concepts for what this could have been for sets like the Snowspeeder are just 
insane off the wall, really cool to look at. Here's the original concept for the Millennium Falcon. I am glad that it ended up just being a concept. There's a second concept here that I'm also very happy stayed a concept and maybe it would look better if it was more fleshed out. Of course, this is just quick and dirty work to get the idea across, but I just don't like it as much as what they ended up coming out with. Now you can see the X-Wing here in a more full version of that Legoland box art. It's just wild looking to me. And I think part of the reason for that is very recently Lego has been doing a lot of these throwback sets with their original themes. And Lego Star Wars was not one of the original like 1960s, 70s, 80s, whatever Lego themes that would have had this box art originally. It's cool to see like what it could have looked like if it was released in 1970, 1980. I think the best two in this style might be the Mos Eisley Cantina and the Snow Speeder, although the color on the Snow Speeder with yellow and blue isn't like the best match, but it's pretty neat to see those sets with a different layout. And here you can see the entire original trilogy edition collection and what that would have looked like if they had gone with some of that original style box art. They even go as far as to put it on shelves next to other sets from the era to see what it would have looked like. I don't think it looked particularly good there. Someone from FBTB.net was actually at the presentation in 2005 and actually has a small recount of it. And part of the reason that those like throwback Lego designs were denied was this image here showing them on shelves next to other sets because apparently they just looked so bad next to the other ones. Another one they threw in here for the Snowspeeder was a concept where they changed out the blue and silver to black and gold. And this is a really classy look for this type of box. Like if they had done this, it would have kept this style that Lego had basically on every set at the time, but done it in a different color scheme that it just screams classy and classic for that Lego Star Wars original trilogy re-release. I think what they ended up with, the fourth and final concept here, it was probably the best one. I do really like it and I have two of them sealed myself in my collection because I like it so much. And I guess it's worth noting at the end of the presentation, he says that this box art style won two different awards, specifically on the Millennium Falcon for one of them, but I don't know what that second award was specifically for, if it was more broadly just the design of it. Anyway, guys, let me know in the comments what you think of all this crazy cool behind the scenes stuff, and let me know if you want to see me make a video of every known LEGO Star Wars prototype set, because I think it's a pretty lengthy list at this point. Anyway, I'm going to link both of the very, very old web pages down in the description below if you wanted to take a closer look for yourself. If you enjoy this type of content and want to see more on LEGO Star Wars, make sure you hit the subscribe button, and you can check out more videos on the end screen now. See ya!